My name is Mandy Breckenridge. I'm one of the technical staff here at ATG USA, and I'll be your host for today's webinar, Revit Families, Planning for More Than Just Types and Parameters. So when it comes to families, we really could spend days talking about them, from geometry creation and flexible families to instance and type debates that could go all over the place, to custom formulas, shared parameters, there's all kinds of things that we could be discussing. But today, I really wanted to get back to basics, back to square one, and discuss a few of the absolute basic framework pieces of family planning, things that often get overlooked if we are mostly just modifying existing families, maybe adding new types and parameters here and there. But most of what we talk about today, they all have pieces that must be evaluated, they must be decided early on in the family creation process. Um, and we are all Anybody who touches Revit really needs to know this type of things, especially if they touch uh, touch any part of families. Um, anybody, anybody can learn a little bit about families, even if they don't typically use them, or at least make them. So for the next 30 to 40 minutes or so, we'll be looking specifically at the following items. We'll be jumping in and out of Revit a little bit, um, but for the most part, we'll go in this order. We'll talk a little bit about Revit object categories. Now, this is basic, but it really is important. Um, we're going to get into how templates work, which seem obvious, but there's some things that can be changed about them. There's some things that can be customized and added to. Some things are permanent. Some things can be adjusted. So we'll get into all of that. We'll discuss different family hosting strategies and how it is critical that hosting strategies be planned from the beginning of family creations. We'll get into an overview of the Revit family category and parameters dialog box. There's a little bit of extra tools in there that everyone needs to know about if they're dealing with families. We'll learn a little about subcomponents in families and how they could add more flexibility to how objects are visually controlled in a project. And then we'll end today with a brief look at one aspect of nesting families and related to scheduling specifically. Um, nesting families is another things that another topic that you can really get get into into over a long period of time, but when it comes to scheduling, there are certain things you have to set up ahead of time, and I wanted to touch that, touch on that today with the rest of these items. It's not something you can change later very easily. So before we jump into the meat of our talk, it really is important that everybody be on the same page and understand how it important families are within Revit. And again, this seems obvious, but I did want to take a moment to revisit how Revit is actually using family uh, categories throughout a project. And hint, it's everywhere. So family categories truly are the building blocks of how most of Revit is organized. Some tools on the ribbon, like doors and windows, that button you push, um, it will only list objects that Revit thinks is a door or a window. Schedules require you to select a family category in order to schedule anything, and only things in that category will appear on the schedule. Um, it's, it's just everywhere. Family categories are so ingrained into everything, and so much of visibility graphics, that interface, is just changing how specific categories of objects appear in the view. It's all category driven, all of the content that we use. When using Revit tags in your projects, Many only work on specific categories, so a door tag is only looking for doors. So as you build content, it needs to be a door. Seems obvious, but again, I see a lot of people keeping things as generic models in their families, and this is why a lot of this content might be a little bit fuzzy and not working exactly correctly. And if you've ever worked with project parameters, you've seen that they can only be applied to objects once the object's category is checked. And even DWG export settings, we don't look at this just a whole lot, or maybe a lot of people don't, but the family category is what's driving how the layers are established. And so category becomes so important within Revit, and making sure that your family components are in the correct category is incredibly important if you want to be able to control them and use them as Revit anticipates. So let's take a look quickly at a new family in Revit, and specifically what is actually driving Revit to decide what category it is. So we'll be jumping in and out of Revit. So hopefully I do this as smoothly as possible. So I've just got Revit's basic sample project up and we'll be in and out of this today. We're not doing much with the actual project itself, but we'll use it as a base point. So if I were to create a new family in Revit, just new family, 
most of you've probably done this, but if you haven't, it does bring up template files for you to choose from. And these template files are kind of like the same way we would think about project template files. They're nice to have and they preset up some of the things that we would uh, typically need to use in a particular family if we're trying to make a category of the type of family that's listed. So casework might have some things sp specific to casework. There's a couple of options for casework even. We have one wall-based template family that's pre-set up. It's convenient. We don't have to use wall-based. We could use the regular. We also have some things for annotations and title blocks. All of that should just be remembered that it's in here. But notice as we start to scroll through this that we have some things that are set to actual Revit categories like ducts, transitions, doors, data panels, but some things are actually still just generic models. And we're going to look at this for a moment because generic models, in my opinion, are not a category. They are because you do have a um, visibility graphics ability to control them as a category. But if you have too many things inside of a generic model category of all different types of things within Revit, it's useless to use visibility graphics for this. But there are some things that we can do to change generic models that I want everybody to leave today with a good understanding of what is modifiable and then what is fixed within an actual Revit template. So let's just start with generic model template. Notice this is an RFT file. This is not a family file, it's a template file. But as soon as we open this, this is creating an RFA family file for us. And since this is a generic model family, Revit says this could be anything. I have all kinds of different tools pre-assigned on my ribbon. This could have some electrical components to it. It could be anything. So one of the things to keep in mind is this button here. Um, this is called the family category and parameters button. And this is actually what is establishing what category this template is actually falling in at all. Now, if I select this button, I can see that generic models is highlighted. The template that I used automatically selected generic models here. But one thing to remember that within Revit is this is all modifiable. I started with a generic model template, but I could easily, just as easily change this to doors just by selecting this button. And let's do that really quickly. Go back to generic models. Notice that I have some options for generic models that adjust differently. Revit thinks this is a door family if I leave this selected. Revit thinks this is a generic model family. Whether if I leave this selected, it doesn't matter what template I use. The template is convenience. The template is not set in stone necessarily when it comes to the category. So let's leave this doors for just a moment and I'll hit OK. Now notice what happens up on my ribbon. I used to have connectors available to me when this was a generic model family or when Revit thought this was a generic model family when generic model was selected. But when it's a door family, Revit adjusts what I have, what tools I have available to me. So let's take a look again here. I've changed this to a door family and now in the family types, I have some things just automatically loaded in into the, the typical type window that maybe you're familiar with, four doors things that wouldn't be in every generic model, rough width, rough height, all kinds of things related to doors. If I change this back to a generic model family, however, just by selecting that yellow folder and changing the Revit category to generic model, I'm gonna go back to my type properties and notice that all of that additional, all of those additional parameters that had to do with doors are removed. So Revit does have some built-in things to pay attention to, but it's not set in stone. So the good thing about that is when we get into the um, hosted objects, and I'm going to go back to my presentation quickly. That's not it. I think I closed it. No, I didn't. There it is. I'll probably do that a lot, so please just bear with me. <laughs> Hey, having multiple windows up. So I have a question for you. So we looked at Revit categories. We know they're important. We know they're everywhere in Revit. We have to pick the right category. If it's a door, we need it to be a door. We also know that choosing the correct host is important. And the question I have for you is, would you ever need a door that is not hosted to the wall or a wall? 
Now, most doors that we use within Revit, they are wall hosted families and you put a wall in, the door automatically finds the wall, it'll put the door in. It won't just set a door off to the side somewhere if you don't have a wall. But is there a case? Can you make a case where you might want a door not in a wall? And I would say, well, possibly, right? You could have some sort of door panel hanging between two columns and technically you wouldn't have put a wall there. Uh, but many of you probably, if you're like me in the past, would put a little wall there anyway because your doors are wall hosted and you have to have it there. Let's jump back to Revit quickly. If I were to open a door family from scratch, right? So if I go to file and I wanna make a door family a new family and I want to make a door family that is not wall hosted. What are my options here? The Revit template tells me I have two options, curtain wall and door. So let's just open the door family and see what my see what I can do with that. Inside of this door family by default there is a wall and if I check the Revit family category parameters it thinks it's a door, but if I scroll down, the host is a wall and it's not changeable. Since this family, this door family is a wall hosted template, even though it didn't say that in the name, it actually is, it's a wall hosted template. I am set with a wall hosted template. I can't change that. That is something that anything using this template will be wall hosted and there's not a way to change that without going through some really big hoops and some hacks and Revit to kind of come at that from another direction, but but really it is set at wall and it's always set at wall. But what do we do, right? How can you create a door that is not wall hosted if there's no template for it? So this is where the ability to change category types comes in very handy. So let me close this out and I'll start over. If I go back to my file, new family, and I wanna create a door that is just a door, a door that's out in space. It's not a wall. Maybe it's a gate panel. Maybe it's something hosted to columns. I don't have to start with a door. Remember, this is just for convenience. I could start with a, a generic model. It's not a wall hosted generic model. It's not a roof hosted generic model, just a generic model, just like we did a while ago. And if I open this, currently it's a generic model. All I have to do is change the category to doors and I have created a non-wall hosted door. Revit, if I load this project, if I actually made, made a family and loaded it into a project, Revit would think this was a door. It would schedule it like a door. It would visibility graphic override it like a door. And for all intents and purposes, this is a door regardless of what family type I started with. So here's another one. Would you ever need a light that is not hosted to a wall or a ceiling? Now, some of you may have already ran into this question as you've worked in Revit throughout the years, um, specifically if you've ever worked with projects with exposed structure and maybe there is no Revit ceiling that you can attach a light to, uh, you've noticed that your ceiling hosted light fixtures just kind of give you all kinds of warnings. You can't attach them to a soffit, a Revit soffit. You can't attach them to the underside of the roof deck. You can't attach them to the, the face of beams or the underside of a piece of millwork. A Revit hosted or a ceiling hosted Revit light fixture must have a Revit ceiling. Well, most of the time that's probably not an issue, but there are times where, well, you just really need to attach something to a beam or attach something to something else, a soffit. So what do you do? How can you create a light fixture that is faced hosted if there's no template? So let's look back at our templates and get rid of some of these. I really wish Revit 2000 20 would have the view name and the file name up there. I wish I just had to get rid of everything. But let's restart. So if I wanted to, to have a face hosted light fixture, new family, I might first go to my light fixtures and I have the option for ceiling hosted, wall based, regular, another ceiling hosted, another wall based and another linear regular. I want face based. Let's say I don't want it to just float arbitrarily. I want it to find a face of something and attach to it. I could start with generic model, face-based, just like the door did. Cl click open. Right now it's a generic model, but all I have to do is click the category and change it to light fixture. And now I have a 
notice that some things changed. Now I have a face hosted light fixture family. Notice that the connectors stay here because these are allowed in, face, in any kind of light family. I also have some additional options. Let me click this button again. And we'll get into some of, more of these in just a moment, but I did wanna mention this as I talk about light fixtures, that I can say the light source is, is visible or not, and that light source is automatically there. Even though we started with generic models, it automatically knows to come in once we change the category. So two things to keep in mind as you're starting to plan the category of things and knowing which template to pick, categories can change, hosts cannot. Hosts have to pick the right template. And so this begs the question, let me get back to my window. How do you know what host to decide? What's the best host to pick? Is there, is there a preference? And I would probably argue that each type of hosting does have its pros and cons. Um, in general, think about not just the end product, but how you sequence your modeling in Revit. Uh, and the variety of ways you might want to use that particular family. Um, I'm all for hosted, like wall hosted, ceiling hosted things, if, if that's the only place it can ever possibly attach to. If it doesn't make any sense to attach it to anything else, well, then that would be fine. But in general, I avoid making items floor-based, floor hosted. It's a personal preference that I prefer non-hosted families for things that go on the floor and just make them level associated. Uh, this lets me play with the layout of a space or the layout of a building uh, just kind of in a sandbox form without having to worry about modeling a floor first in order to attach a toilet to it. I want to just be able to pull the toilet in, not worry about what the floor exactly is yet. I'm just playing for layout. And if I had floor hosted toilets, well, they need a floor, just like ceiling hosted lights need a ceiling. So keep that in mind. Sometimes making object hosted families doesn't give you very much flexibility in how to use them in other ways. Um, but I generally do like to use one of the hosted options, either the object hosted or the face based hosted for anything that's going to be attached to walls or ceilings or roofs. Um, both of them um, allow things to attach to them and stay attached to them. So if you uh, move the wall, whether it's face based or object hosted, that object you've attached moves with the wall, which is really nice. Non-hosted items would still just kind of stay put. You'd have to go find them and move everything after the fact. Um, but I generally do lean towards face-based objects most of the time because they're, they can just go anywhere. It doesn't have to be a wall. It could be the side of millwork. It could be attached to anything that has a face, basically. And inside face space families, once you load them into the project, you have the options to, in plan view, apply them to a vertical face, just from the options up in your ribbon. Uh, it, it's really user-friendly, user really easy to, to use. Um, one thing to keep in mind, specifically with light fixtures, I don't see this a whole lot of other places, but it's, it's this one. If you do a ceiling hosted light fixture, uh, and then you decide you want to rotate your, maybe your, your um, lay in ceiling grid. If it's a ceiling hosted light, it will rotate with the grid. It kind of moves with anything in that ceiling. If it's a face based light and you rotate your grid, those lights, those lights just stay attached to the face. They stay like they were before and the grid looks like it's rotating differently from the lights. So that is something you have to plan for a little bit. Um, one thing with each one of these, columns um, is highlighted in yellow and I think this is probably my favorite thing of, uh, of both of these or at least the most important thing to me. For non-hosted items you can just drop them anywhere and for me that's floor, floor, floor mounted stuff but like um, furniture in the middle of the room not attached to anything non-hosted is fine. Avoid floor hosted that means you have to put a floor in ahead of time. Um, object hosted, like doors, if you put doors in walls, the doors can actually read the thickness of the wall when they're wall hosted, and that thickness can be reported on a schedule. And for jam sizing and some things on door schedules, that's preferred. I don't use that for a lot of things besides doors, but if you did, you might consider keeping things object hosted, like wall hosted. Um, and then face spaces are just super flexible. 
so handy. So keep that in mind. Um, Revit defaults to sort of wall hosted things and ceiling hosted things. So if you do um, have a preference for how you model things, you may want to start from scratch and start with face based versus object face or even renaming your family so you know when it which which families are face based and which families are ob object based. So aside from family categories and whether something is hosted to something else, um, there are a few more things set up in your family that affect how you're able to use the family in the project. And we're going to look back at the bottom panel of the, fa the family category window and sort of look specifically at what some of these things are. Um, you saw me click the turn the, the uh, light fixture source on that showed up when you had it in the light fixture category. But some of these are a little bit more basic. Uh, so the top half of the window is where you can change that category family. It's important. It can change to anything. It's extremely flexible. But the bottom portion of the family has some additional options called family parameters. And these, these are not parameters that you make. Uh, they come standard with whatever family category you pick. They just automatically will pop in that window. But they're important because each one of these drives something about how your family that you're making works. Um, they're generally just check boxes, maybe some drop down menus. And I've included their descriptions here that I won't read all of this to you exactly, but I did want to go through some of those. So um, remember that if you change the category up here in the top, the bottom part does update. So just keep in mind when you can't find something later that you probably change the category and it's just not part of that category. If you check work plane based, that means that the family will be hosted on the active work plane. Um, this is how I like to kind of attach free floating things to the floor, <laughs> to a level, as opposed to having them maybe floating a little bit, a little bit more. Um, I want them to be associated with a particular level as opposed to just floating in space, let's say. And if you select cuts with voice when loaded, that just means that when you load this into a project, you can use your family to cut a void in something else. The void that is in your family, the void geometry, can physically make a hole in something else that's in your project. Um, always vertical means that your family stays 90 degrees even with your when your host is sloping. So if your roof is sloping, it's not coming out um, perpendicular to the roof. It's staying 90 degrees to the ground level. Oops, I'm sorry. Wow, mouse wheel. <laughs> and just remember that your host in this particular particular instance, since I'm looking at a generic model, when I made the screen capture, my host said nothing. It's still grayed out, but it's nothing. It, it's, it's not hosted to anything. And host key is, uh, ho host choice is key. The template choice is what determines what the host is, and it's permanent. And I've put an asterisk there because there's some hacks you can find online to change that, but it should be treated as permanent. It should be um, Take some time to think about how you use your families before you uh, just pick a wall hosted or ceiling hosted perhaps. Another interesting one on this particular option in family parameters is one called room calculation point. So I have it here, it's just a checkbox. And what this does is give you a little uh, leader that can be dragged into a room. It's almost like a little dot or a reference point that can be dragged into a room that lets that object be counted as part of the things in that room. Revit thinks that it's inside the room even if it's on the boundary of the room like a window or a door. So that being checked allows you to possibly schedule things inside of a room or account for things inside of a room in a way that you would not be able to otherwise. And we're going to get into shared this shared button in just a moment. I do want to mention that this um, is dealing only when something is nested into another family. And this is this is what we're going to get to a little bit later in today's discussion. And you'll always find some extra stuff there uh, in this little window. So since this is a generic model, it's including some items like can host rebar. Well, it Revit doesn't know what you're building. So there's a few of these that just kind of kind of once you pick an actual category will go away, but they may be some miscellaneous items or for MEP or structural, and it's just because Revit does not know what you're building. So let's switch topics for just a minute. That's that's enough on on categories and, and um, templates. Um, let's look at visibility graphics for just a minute and how Revit is actually 
showing all of this family content that you're making. And we're going to be looking at subcategories specifically, but the easiest way to see kind of subcategories in use are to actually look at them in a project. So subcategories, what are they? So if I go to visibility graphics here, and we talked about how Revit uses the category of families to really control all kinds of things about what things are turned on and turned off in your views. So a casework family, I can change it just in this view to be a thicker line weight, maybe a different color. I can adjust casework completely in this view. Floor plan, level one view. I could change it. <clears throat> but notice that a lot of these families also have little drop down menus. These are subcategories. So I can change the overall parent category in many different ways, and that would change everything about casework, all casework everywhere. But I could also independently ch change these little subcategories. And let's look at a door, actually. This one's a great one. So this is how you could potentially have your panel of your door at one line weight and the swing of your door at another line weight or the cut line at a different line weight for some different parts and pieces within your family. So there's the line for the whole door altogether, maybe turn the whole door red or something for some reason in your view, or each individual part and piece of the door could potentially be changed independently of one another. So let's look at a door family really quickly and I'll show you where those sub, uh, subcategories are coming from and how to make a new one. So I'm just going to go look at this particular, oh yeah, I can see I was playing with this earlier and I made my panel super thick just to show that you could change this independently of one another. I'll show you where that is. So my panel, my door panel, I can just clear that out and it'll go back to normal. So my door panels go back to normal. But we'll take a look at this particular door. And I'm just going to edit the family since it's already created. And we'll just look at a 3D view. So I can tell that this is a wall hosted door. All, pretty much all Revit doors by default are wall hosted unless you make your custom family like we looked at. <coughs> and I can check up here if I wasn't convinced that my host is wall. And I can check here that my category is indeed door so it will be scheduling appropriately. Now subcategories. How am I driving the subcategories of this? Let's take, take a, a look first at the plan view. So I've got 3D content that I saw in 3D. That's the frame and the panel, a frame on the other side. But I also have some two-dimensional content. I have some lines here, all right? So three-dimensional content, two-dimensional lines, works perfectly. Now let's take a look back at, in a family, what those lines are called. So if I go to an annotation tab and just put a line in my family, it just says line style. It's a line. In a project, any line you draw, Revit thinks it's a line. Now jumping back to my family, ground floor, same thing, annotate, symbolic line. Notice what it's called. It's not called a line type anymore. It is a subcategory of your of your actual family file. So in this case, Revit automatically starts with some of these just already filled in. And depending on what category you select here, you'll have some different things automatically sort of populating at first. So we have some options for doors. We have some options for an elevation swing. We have frame mullion, whether it's a projection or cut through. We have all kinds of different options because when I'm drawing two dimensionally, I could be drawing this panel to be shown cut through, but I don't want a heavy line here. And that's why it sort of has all of these different um, cut versus project projection. And it's just automatically will do that. You don't have to make both of those. But when it comes to 3D objects, let me switch to a 3D view. Those aren't lines, so we have to look in a little bit different location. So this particular frame extrusion over here in my properties, I have a subcategory line. When I click here, I've got some other options that probably were already here when this template 
this is this is a Revit out of the box content. So I bet all of this is in the actual door template. But I can choose that this guy that I have highlighted is frame mullion. And when I do that inside of my project, that subcategory line will drive the visibility of this. My panel, this one was already set at panel, but that's what's my in my project because I have this piece of 3D object tied to a subcategory, the subcategory can drive it, can drive its visibility. So I like subcategories because the only other option, one of the other main options for driving the visibility of something is by selecting it. And you've got some visibility settings. Let's take a look at what are here. I can turn things on and off or just not display play it all in plan view, which is what this particular panel is doing, or maybe it just shows in front and back, maybe it just shows with its cut, or it only shows at certain detail levels. But let's say you had something where you had maybe three or four course view, course view plan views in your project, and each one needs to show the door a little bit different. Well, you can't drive all of those different differences with this particular tool. So subcategories comes in handy because you can, you can, you can really grant, make your families kind of granular if you want to. And a lot of that's already built in there. All right. So let's see if we wanted to create a whole new category. Let's say that in my floor plan, I wanted to show a panic bar. Maybe I have a really a really dedicated fire marshal who wants to see panic egress hardware shown in the plan that you present to him, right? And you need to have some kind of graphic to show up on the, you know, whatever door, the, whatever side the door swinging on panic hardware. And so if you wanted to draw a line, annotate, symbolic line, there's not really, there's not really a category for that already here. It wouldn't make sense to put it on any one of these other ones. Um, so you might want to make your own. And if just as a, a reminder that these are not lines, you may think you can go to the manage tab, just like you would make a new line type, manage tab, additional settings, line styles, straight out. It does not let you pick line styles because there are no lines in families. It is all subcategories. So get to a subcategory by hitting your visibility graphics of the family. And these are actually all of just the types that were there. Remember that what we saw up in the lines when we looked, each one of these had a few uh, cut view and, and projection view. It's really just one type that you're making and Revit automatically makes those types, different uh, versions of it in the lines. We wanna add two here. We wanna add one of, add a new hardware element to doors. And so what I need to do is go to object styles and there's a, once you do that, you have this little little section over here that says modify subcategories. And we just want to make a new one. And this is going to add it to door, which means inside of my project, underneath the door heading, it's going to have a subcategory below it that's going to say hardware. All right. Once I do that, I can preset some line weights. Maybe my cut's not too heavy. Maybe I just, I don't know if this is even set up. Uh, but I now have a subcategory of doors called hardware that at least is going to be in this particular family. But let's see what happens. I go to annotate and I want that line now. My subcategory I have a hardware section. I can draw lines that represent that hardware if it's cut through. I can have lines that represent that hardware if it's being projected. If I were to have a 3D object, which I didn't load one in beforehand, but let's say this is hardware, I'm just selecting the frame, I can see that I can change this to hardware by selecting it here. And now Revit thinks this piece is a hardware subcomponent and it can be driven in visibility graphics inside your project that way. All right? So let me load this file into my project really quickly. And we'll look. So let's go back to visibility graphics. And just prove that that hardware is now an option here. That's the one we added. Now something to keep in mind is that I only added this hardware in one family. So this will only drive the families where it's been used. That's one thing to keep in mind and why if you do want to use subcategories and want to add to them, add a lot of other things to them, then you do want to plan this ahead of time as opposed to having happening in this particular sample project file where I have these 
someone added a bunch of extra things like molding architrave, iron mongery, architrave. These aren't in every door. So I can, these are only driving whatever doors had those in them. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense of how you might want to split up how you handle some of your family visibility. It doesn't have to be all in uh, the main heading line. You can, you can really, you can really um, split this up to be able to control it depending on how you need to control it at your firm and all of your different views that you're doing. You just have to plan ahead just a little bit. Let's jump back. So subcategories, some things to keep in mind. What might I need to control separately from the overall family? Um, does anything need to be able to have a thicker line weight in some views versus other views or to be a different color in some views versus other views or a piece of the family dash differently in a particular view or to turn something on and off regardless of the coarseness, regardless of whether it's coarse, medium or fine um, detail level. Just remember that a subcategory only controls families that are actually using it. Uh, I put that hardware subcategory in that one family and that's the only one that it actually is actually tied to at the moment. Uh, and be sure that as you start to add those subcategories amongst all of your families that you spell it correctly and correctly meaning spell it how the other ones are spelled and watch for dashes and spaces and names to need to match or you'll end up creating two subcategories unintentionally. Let's look back at my Revit and get my door again. If I wanted to maybe pull in those subcategories that I already had in a project. Maybe I had, I don't want to go in and retype visibility graphics, each one of these all this time, and hopefully I get them all spelled right. If I want to pull that in, all I have to do is go to the Manage tab, Transfer Project Standards. It's like you can pull in materials from your project or pull in you know, other things from your project, or copying it from my project. I can pull in object styles. And these are basically pulling in the subcomponents sub for doors. If I'm in a door family, it's going to look for just object styles for a door. We'll go new only. And that was pretty quick. If I click on anything, I come over here and I can see architrave. Right. I can see ironmongery. All of those things that the project had can be easily pulled into any family. Um, you may not need them all, but at least you can kind of push them back and forth between families a little bit quicker than typing them all, especially since spelling is so important. All right, next. A few points on nesting, and I want to put a big asterisk here because nesting is another one of those things that might, you know, take an entire webinar in itself, but there is a part of dealing with nesting uh, that needs to be talked about today because it is something that has a decision that has to be made pretty early on. It's not something you can change easily later. If you're not familiar with the term nesting in Revit, it just means that you are loading in a complete family into another family. So you're nesting a complete object into another family. And nesting comes in really handy when you have um, complex geometry that you don't want, that you want to be able to copy around inside of a new family without it breaking and being, having so many reference points all over the place. So we're going to look at a table and chairs family specifically um, to see how this out of the box Revit content is nesting things and to show um, exactly what's happening in the schedule and what the hang up would be if you don't get this uh, planned correctly ahead of time. So again, back to this. I've got a family loaded in here. This is an out of the box furniture family from Revit. This one's called table dining round with chairs. This is the 36 diameter one. So you can see that it's highlighting all together. Let's take a look at what's actually happening in that family. And just to hit home, I'm gonna go back and we're gonna check this family to see what exactly Revit thinks it is. Furniture family, just like we would expect. Um, Notice that um, host is nothing, it's just non hosted to anything. What do we have here? We have, uh, it's like we have at the table is modeled inside of this family because I have all of these kind of modifiable parts and pieces. The chair itself selects as a whole and is actually modified 
and created in a whole separate family it's been loaded into this family. and i can tell by over on my project fam my family project browser that my families that are loaded in are this chair i can load families into this family file and i can see all of the other families that i've loaded in. let's just select this chair we're going to edit its family and there's one thing that i want to look at in today's webinar back up in our Family category and parameters button. There is an option for shared here. This is what I skipped earlier. And shared only applies to nested families. You can check it all you want to if you don't have anything nested in your family, it doesn't do anything. Since this chair is put into another family, this becomes important because when shared is selected, it means that this particular chair, even though it's going to be loaded into that other family, can be tabbed to hitting tab selected um, tagged independently from the rest of the family and it can show up in the schedules and be counted independently from the rest of the family so let's take a look so here's my family if I just highlight over it the whole thing selects I can hit tab select each individual component That's because it's shared I can tag it annotate tag by category I can get the whole thing which tags has its individual tag I think these are probably type marks for the entire family. If I hit tab, or even just kind of hover right over a chair, the chair can tag separately. So if you need that functionality, be sure inside of before you group these together that you share this component. Now let's look at this table as a whole again. Notice that this table says it's shared this isn't really doing anything actually <laughs> in this project because this this whole family is not nested into another family necessarily right but if i wanted to say you know what i don't need this shared i'm just going to come in and uncheck this if i load it back in the project it gives me a warning it says you can't load a non-shared version of a family because a shared version has already existed. So if you if you end up trying to kind of come back off of whatever you select for your shared strategy or not shared strategy or what you're trying to schedule or not schedule, I mean, it is difficult to change later. There becomes, um, it becomes necessary to jump through a lot of hoops, rename families and try to sort of re-put families together in order for it to schedule appropriately. So having a strategy and a decision making of whoever is building your family is to make sure that it is um, shared if you want to schedule it independently and not shared from the get-go if you don't want to schedule it independently so let's take a look at an actual let's take a look at an actual furniture schedule to see what's going on here so there's a bunch of furniture in this project i'm only concerned about these bottom ones so i can see my four chairs Right, like chair one, it's counting all of them independently. Even though chairs are part of this family, it's counting this whole family together too. So if I, as long as this is named okay, maybe that's okay. But hypothetically, a better solution might be to make the chairs in their own family and share it, and then make the table in its own family and share it and then put them together in a family. That way that your table is scheduling as one item, your chairs are all scheduling one item um, as an option. It doesn't have to be, but it just depends what you wanna see, how you want to tag things, and what's important for however your firm handles things. So sharing, perfectly great solution, just make sure that you, you have a strategy from the get-go. That's all I really wanted to talk about about nesting. Um, but as you can tell, you know, we, we've, we've talked quite a bit today. Um, all kinds of things that need to be considered from the get-go on, on families. They're not difficult. None of them are, are really as quite intense as shared parameters and some of that kind of stuff. But there are some decisions that have to be made ahead of time. And it may, 
it may behoove you to consider actually creating your own starting templates for some of the families. A lot of people don't realize you can do this. Uh, but if you do find yourself starting with Revit's templates and adding all of your content like hatch patterns and materials and formulas and parameters over and over again, you can actually make your own template and this would be a good starting place for you and your company to use. So just the, the, um, the framework is up here. You create a new family, do everything you want to do to it, the actual family file, name it and save it. And then in Windows, go back and just change it to an RFT. It's like those templates for RFTs. And then later, just browse to that, that template and it will create you a Revit family category and have all of your Office's standard stuff in there. This saves you a little bit of time. Um, Subcategories set, set up ahead of time are great. Reference planes, dimensions set up ahead of time are great. It's one more thing to keep, keep an eye out for. So again, long-winded, um, but hopefully this was a good discussion for some of you, especially if you have haven't gotten too far into families, uh, remember it's not just about types and parameters. There are some pretty big decisions that need to happen early, like setting the category correctly, the subcategory correctly, especially setting what your hosting type is because you can't change this very easily later. And if you're going to be pulling families together, pay attention to whether it's shared or not so that you can see it. Right. We've got just a few minutes left. Um, thank you. Thank you for joining us today. I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Just type them into Zoom. Uh, but while you're typing, I want to take the opportunity to invite you to be part of ATG's first universal BIM user group on Wednesday, September 4th. Uh, it doesn't matter where you live. Just join life from your computer. And if, if you've never attended a local user group in your region, they tend to be a little different from webinars. Um, Many are more like round table discussions. Uh, the presentations are often pretty casual. There's lots of good industry wide content, lots of audience interaction at times. Um, presenters might be someone from ETG, might be from Autodesk, they might be from the BIM community at large, or even one of you if you'd like to show off a project, um, maybe a BIM strategy that you're proud of. Um, this very first one is going to be on laser scanning. We're highlighting a project, um, a million feet scanned, 9,000 scans in Autodesk Recap, and it was all planned from the get-go to be able to be organized and split up efficiently and still be usable. So we're going to be talking about that on September 4th. So if you want to be invited, um, put in the chat window that you'd like a direct link. Otherwise, be on the lookout for our marketing department's consent forms. Um, Enjoy, uh, invite you all to join. Any questions? Looks like I have a couple. Uh, it says, here's a question. If all of the nested items are under the same subcategory, like generic, does it make it more difficult to individually control line weights or scheduling? Um, perhaps uh, the, the nested components, uh, you can always inside of each family. So think of a nested component as its own family. Inside that family, you can still control some subcategories. The seat of the chair can be controlled with the seat chair or seat subcategory. Um, and then just like um, the, main, so the main family you pull it into, it can have subcategories as well. So especially if it's shared, the subcategories filter through, if that makes sense. Um, and I would say be careful with subcategories because um, obviously you can see in that Revit standard practice file that just having them in the list doesn't mean that they're driving anything. So you have to just make sure that you, um, you want to plan for what you really need them to do, not just splitting things up into pieces just for the, f the sake of splitting them up. Um, and again, please uh, let me know if anyone wants a link to that that laser skinning presentation. Otherwise, everybody else should get a marketing pass. Any other questions for today? Someone said, um, not part of the webinar, but I struggle with type param parameters, shared versus just regular. Um, we may just need to do a, a, a whole webinar on parameters, shared parameters, type parameters, project parameters, family parameters. <laughs> well, I hope for those of you who haven't touched families much, that this at least gives you something um, to start with. It's not, um, there's no one right answer to do much in Revit, but I do like to know what my options are, and I think you probably do too. Just remember that when you're starting families from templates, that that's just a suggestion. Just make sure that you, you select the correct host and think about why you're hosting in the way you are ahead of time. Um, this is knowing that categories can change is great when you download content from manufacturers. 
most manufacturers, or at least a lot, I shouldn't say most, they tend to put things in the wrong category. They leave things as generic models when they should be bores. They put things in specialty equipment when you might put them in mechanical equipment. Um, you can change those after the fact. So just be, be confident and it really doesn't do much, but just move it in your in your project so that you can um, visibly, visually control them a little more. Again, thank you everyone joining us live. We'll send out a copy of this presentation, um, a link to this presentation, just like usual. And anyone who asks for a link to the ATG Universal Webinar, I'll go ahead and send that to you ahead of time as well. Thank you. Thank you again. Everybody have a nice day.